If you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we will read from verses 12 through 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 through 17, I'll read out of the New American Standard this morning. Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord... I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to the one an aroma from death to death, to the other an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Praise God for the reading of his word. You guys can have a seat. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time of worship, brothers and sisters in Christ, here in this place on the Lord's Day, singing, praying, giving, all worshiping to you. May we worship in word, may our ears hear what you want us to hear this morning from your word. May we be a sweet aroma to each other and to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody here know what the olfactory nerve is? Anybody ever heard of the olfactory nerve? Gentry has an idea, it looks like, but he's pointing in the wrong direction. Yes. It is the first cranial nerve. We have 12 cranial nerves and the shortest cranial nerve. The first one, the olfactory nerve is what helps with your sense of smell so when you smell something what's happened is impulses are sent from through this cranial nerve to your brain to say oh well that smells like a sausage biscuit oh that smells like a scum oh this smells like an onion whatever that is the olfactory nerve so it's how we smell every odor you come across sends millions of impulses it can be a warning sign right you can smell a gas leak. You can smell smoke, right? Where there's smoke, there's fire. You can smell a skunk, I mentioned. I just, a couple of weeks ago, I ran over a skunk on my way to work. And my olfactory nerve was going haywire, working overtime. Even now, a couple weeks later, I still have that hint in my car. But it can be a foretaste of something wonderful, right? We smell supper cooking. We smell something that reminds us of something from a long time ago. Our brain is really hooked into our sense of smell. I can smell something these days, and I can think, I don't remember why exactly, but I'm like, that reminds me of third grade. I don't know if y'all ever do that or not. But you smell something like that. That reminds me of a specific place or a specific time. Fragrance is used a lot of times to sell things, right? Newspaper ads, they give you little samples. You go into a store, they have the little testers where you can spray or you can rub lotion on your hand, see if it smells good. Aromas can be pleasing to us, but they are also pleasing to the one who made us, to God. Over and over again, we saw in the Old Testament, what? Burnt offerings, right? A soothing aroma to the Lord is repeated over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. Why were the burnt offerings of bulls and rams a soothing aroma to the Lord? In Hebrews, it says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. How could that be a soothing aroma if he tells us later in his word that it's impossible for those things to take away sin? It's a soothing aroma because it was a foretaste 
of his son coming as the sacrificial lamb who would take away the sin of the world. It was a soothing aroma to God for this reason and this reason only. They were pictures of his son. Pictures of him becoming the scapegoat, becoming the Passover lamb. That soothing aroma making peace between God and man. That is why those were soothing aromas. It's the Lord Jesus. And we've just got two points today. And you see them in the text. An aroma of life and an aroma of death. We see the aroma of life and the aroma of death. If you take notes, that's all you got to write. Aroma of life, aroma of death. Christian, you are pleasing to God in Christ. You are a pleasing aroma to God in Christ. Let's look back verses 12 and 13. I'll read those again. Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Well, as Dave's been teaching us in Sunday school and on Wednesday nights, Macedonia is where Thessalonica was, right? And we've, t we've discussed this many times on Wednesdays and in Sunday school, this relationship between Macedonia and Achaia. Achaia was in the south, that's where Corinth was. So we see these, these discussions in Thessalonians and in Corinthians referring to these other regions, these other churches. They were sister churches. So Paul had come to Troas. Why? It was an opportunity to preach the gospel, to share the good news with people who either had never heard it before or who had heard it and needed to hear it some more. Any of us not need to hear the gospel every single day? The gospel is not just for justification. It's not just, I heard the gospel, I believe, now I'm done with it. No. It's every day we've got to hear the gospel. The gospel is our only hope in sanctification too. Who opened that door for Paul? God opened the door. God's the one who orchestrated all of this for his glory, for the proclamation of the gospel there in Troas, where he was supposed to meet up with Titus and then go on to Macedonia. But then something happened. What? Why did Paul go anywhere, right? Because of God, because of the ability to preach the gospel. Acts 16.8 tells us this is where Paul received his Macedonian call. Go preach the gospel. What else happened in Troas? Well, you ever heard of a Trojan horse? Well, Troas was about 10 miles from Troy, where the Trojan horse, the people of Troy, Gentry knows a little bit about that part of history, right? This meetup with Titus didn't happen, though. They were supposed to meet up there. It didn't happen. Paul, he was upset. He says it right there in the text. He said he had no rest for his spirit. Not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. He was upset that he didn't meet Titus there. Why? He was wondering how Titus's visit went with, in Corinth. He was awaiting that news. Remember, I've said this 85,000 times probably as I've preached through 2 Corinthians to say the letter right before this we don't have, that severe letter where he scolded them. He scalded the people of Corinth because of their licentiousness, because of what they had been doing contrary to the gospel. Remember, they're still his brothers. They're still his brothers and sisters. He calls them brothers. He rejoices in them, but he still, he, he scalded them. Had they received that letter well? Had they repented? Had they dealt with the sin that was in their midst? He had no rest for his spirit, waiting on it, anxiously awaiting. It's not like right now we send a text message. Even now we anxiously await the response on text messages sometimes. It's like, where do you want to go eat? Oh, man, I, I hope she says this place. I hope she doesn't say that place. Where, where do you want to 
go do this. Where do you want to go do that? We are so impatient now. Paul is waiting and waiting, waiting months upon months to get the answer, to find out had they repented, had they grown in Christ, had they professed that they truly believe what they say they believe, and have they responded in eliminating the sin in their midst? Had they dealt with it? He's no different than us. He was trusting in the sovereign God of all creation, the sovereign God of all redemption. But what did he say? He said, I had no rest for my spirit. Even Paul, who we will often say is the most sanctified human, not the Lord Jesus, he was still worried. He was worried about his children in the faith. Are they real? Are they walking by faith? Or are they walking by sight? Are they walking in the Lord? Or are they walking by flesh? Are they continuing in their pagan ways from before they had been born again? Are they revealing that maybe they were false converts? He was still worried. Our worry, though, should point us back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what Paul's worry did here in the text. He said in verse 14, but thanks be to God. Yeah, he was anxious. He was nervous. Had they responded biblically? It happens though. Pastors are some of the most depressed people you would ever meet. Why? Because they pour their heart out week in and week out preaching the gospel. Knowing that the Spirit of God will move in His people to sanctify them. And then they fall into the same sin. They, they don't place priority on the Lord's Day worship. They don't seem to be growing. And then the Lord gives encouragement. Here, he brings this encouragement. Paul had been thinking, oh man, they've just not been growing. They're not growing. We talked about this a little in Sunday school. We can be impatient in the sanctification of ourselves, but we can be impatient in the sanctification of others too. Paul might have been a little impatient with the sanctification of Corinth. I get impatient with the sanctification of my kids sometimes. I think, well, you've been a Christian this long and this and that and that. I'm like, man, how long was I a Christian before I ever even really read my Bible on a regular basis? I'm like, dang, my kids are far more sanctified than I was at that point in my Christian walk. Praise the Lord. Elijah, think of Elijah in the Old Testament. Nobody more depressed than Elijah but what? He was refreshed in the Lord. Job at rock bottom. Comforted by the sovereignty of God. Peter had denied his Savior. In a deep, dark depression. What? He was restored personally by Jesus. Over and over and over again. Anxiety. Depression, trials, temptation. They bring you one place. Christian, they bring you to look to Jesus. Christian, don't look at your problems. Know that they're there. And don't look at your troubles. Jesus is our only hope. He is our firm foundation. He is our portion. He is ours. And we are His. If you're hidden in Him. If you're united to Christ by faith alone. The stench of anxiety was making Paul's olfactory nerve go haywire. This anxiety was giving him these feelings of what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? But remember, our feelings don't dictate our belief. Our belief should dictate our feelings. So that's where Paul quickly goes. He was anxious. He was nervous. Yes. But thanks be to God, right? That sweet 
aroma of Jesus Christ brought him rest. Jesus is the only thing that can bring us rest, that can quiet our anxious minds. Xanax or Prozac, Ambien and Ativan, they can pacify for a little while, but only the Lord Jesus can satisfy. We don't want to be pacified. We are to be satisfied in Jesus. His dwelling in us by His Spirit will cause us to dwell upon Him, the most lovely thing, Jesus Christ. To take our focus off of us, off of our troubles, and put them on the right object, on Jesus Christ, the righteous one. When I look at my unrighteousness, I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get depressed. I'm going to be in a deep, dark hole. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, he dealt with, he called it the black dog of depression. Most of his ministry, during this downgrade controversy, most of his friends in ministry had abandoned him. He dealt with this. A lot of people think he died at a young age because of the depression that he dealt with. But he always looked back to the Lord Jesus. What does First Peter tell us? To cast your cares on who? On Him! Let's not bear our own burden. Let's cast them on the one who is able, Jesus Christ. He cares for you. Jesus cares for you, Christian. Do you know that? Do you let that affect your emotions? Do you let the truth of the gospel that Jesus died in your place affect your emotions? Let's look to Him. He cares for us. He is our rest. Let's rest in Him. Let's look back at the text. Verse 14, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Always leads us. Who? Jesus. What? Always. He always leads us. Paul is praising God and he's telling us why right here. He always leads us in triumph in Jesus Christ. Jesus is our champion. And we are his spoil. He has purchased us with his own blood. Jesus, our champion. What do champions do? Well, they're celebrated with a parade, right? Super Bowl champions not long ago, they had a victory parade to celebrate the champions. Queen has a song. What? We are the champions. No, they are wrong. Queen, you're wrong. Jesus is our champion. He is the victor and we are the prize. You've seen pictures of those ticker tape parades after the Allies won in World War II. Teams win the World Series, the victory parades. That's what Paul's getting at here. Christ is our champion. He is the victor. So to him go the spoils, namely you. And now you're in a deep, dark depression and, and anxiety. You're thinking, I am not a prize. Well, in and of ourselves we are not. But united to Christ, we are a prize. We are the love gift from the Father to the Son because the Son is the victor. He purchased us. We are his prize. Christ is our conquering general. He receives the church, us, the body of all believers throughout all time as his prize. Remember what Saul told David he had to do to get Michael's hand in marriage? Bring him a hundred Philistine foreskins. Right, Gentry? David. He could have his daughter, Michael. As a bride, if he would just bring a hundred Philistine foreskins to him. Well, what did David do? David brought him 200, right? 
David, the victor, received his prize. Michael, that bride. Now Christ is the better David. Christ has purchased us with his own blood. Not the blood of Philistines. With his own blood. Christ is the victor over death. Over the devil. Over the grave. And has received you as his prize. Christ imputes his victory to us. To you, Christian. What's verse 15 say? It says, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. That aroma of life. We're finally getting to the point of this text. The aroma of life. That pleasing scent of victory. Of knowing God through Christ. That is the victory that he imputes to us. To know God, to be reconciled to God in Christ. <coughs> Christian, you have the aroma of life because of Jesus and of Jesus alone. The proclamation of the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done, born of a virgin, lived the perfect life, died a substitutionary death, buried in the grave and rose on the third day and he's coming again. He is the pleasing aroma to the Father and to us. And He makes us a pleasing aroma to the Father as well. God is pleased with you, Christian. No matter what sin you have committed this morning, no matter what sin you have committed this week, no matter what sin you committed last night, if you are in Christ, God is pleased with you. You are a pleasing aroma to the Father. Why? Because him being pleased with you is not because of you. It's because of Jesus, the one who always obeyed, the one who never sinned, being credited to your account. That is why God is pleased with you. His perfect obedience on your account. That should motivate us to go live a life in response to that wonderful gift. You bring the aroma of life with you wherever you go. When people know you're a Christian, when people know you are born again, that gospel of peace, the aroma of life, Christ has brought peace between God and man. Because he's the only one worthy. He's the God-man, the obedient one, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. To those being saved, you are a pleasing aroma. You're a pleasing scent in the nostrils of other Christians. What's verse 16 say? To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Now, we are alive because of Christ. We are alive as humans because Christ made us. He gave us life. He gave us breath. But we are alive as Christians more so because we have eternal life. We have it. We're not going to get it. We have it already. Our life is eternal because of what Jesus has done. We are alive because of Christ, because of his propitiation, because our sins were placed on him, his righteousness given to us. We are alive, not we will be alive. We are alive because he lives, because he was resurrected. Christian, you are alive in him and in him alone. Even when you die, you're going to be more alive than you have ever been on account of Jesus if you're in him. Before we move on to this aroma of death, we do want to look at the end of verse 16 and verse 17. So it says, And who is adequate for these things? For we are not like many peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, but as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. Who is adequate? Raise your hand if you're adequate. No, none of us are adequate. None of us no 
but he makes us adequate in the son none is adequate in himself or herself but our efforts are sanctified by christ and i've heard this analogy many times you know our our kid bring uh, i think mike Havencroft used this at the conference he said kids at his church will come bring pictures they've colored of it and he'll say he'll 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 look at him and obviously it's a little kid drawing a stick figure it's terrible. They're not going to hang it up in the loo. They're not going to hang it up in the Museum of Modern Art. But what? Well, they might these days in this postmodern art world we live in. But nonetheless, it's a little kid's drawing. It's not good. But what? Because of his affection for that child, he is pleased with it. He is pleased with that terrible drawing because he has love for that child and the father has love for us and our services may be weak and terrible and stained with sin but man he is pleased with our service to him because it is filtered through the son it is sanctified by christ our qualifications to serve and proclaim come from him alone who is adequate? None. We aren't doing this to make a buck or get famous is what verse 17 is basically saying. We are preaching the gospel to the glory of God alone. We are preaching so that he is glorified in the redemption of sinners and ultimately those who reject the gospel, he is glorified in their destruction, in their eternity of hell. Now, we've looked at the aroma of life, this pleasing aroma that we are to God through Christ. This pleasing aroma that we are to each other. This pleasing aroma that Christ is to us. Now, let's look at the aroma of death. Two people can smell the same thing. And how their olfactory nerve moves it from their nostrils to their brain can be the same. But how their brain interprets that smell can be polar opposites. Bring an onion in here and put it in the middle of fellowship meal today. Now, that onion will elicit the same olfactory stimulation. But guess what? How our brains interpret that will be totally different. My wife will be running for the door... Tracy over here may be saying, give me more onion, right? That is how it is different. It's the same smell. It's an aroma of life to Tracy. It's an aroma of death to my wife and with that onion. And that is the same thing. The gospel is the aroma of life to some. And it is the aroma of death to others. You'll see, to one one response to another another response two people can grow up in the same church hear the same gospel do all the same things their entire life one of them aroma of death the other an aroma of life jc on the way to church she might spray some perfume in the wife's car to her it's an aroma of life she loves it to the rest of us, choking, rolling our windows down, it's an aroma of death. Two different groups, two different responses to the same olfactory stimulation. <clears throat> the same gospel. Two people. Two different responses. It's all about who they are in. Are they in Adam or are they in the last Adam? Are they in Christ or are they children of the devil? One softened by the Holy Spirit receives the good news of Jesus with joy unto life. One hardened by the fallen Adamic nature rejects the good news and is hardened all the more. Remember Pharaoh, right? Hardened. But Moses heard the same message. He was softened. King Saul hardened. 
King David softened. One thief on the cross hardened. The other thief on the cross, the same message, softened unto life. We are saved by grace through faith. Think of the parable of the soils. There were four soils there, right? Only one was a soil unto life. The other three, soils unto death. What's verse 15 say again? For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. One fragrance, two results. One fragrance to the ones being saved and to the ones perishing. Two responses. This should embolden our evangelism, right? Because we know the results are not up to us. You don't have to scheme. You don't have to coax. You don't have to manipulate. You don't have to say, come on down with every eye closed and every head bowed. Come on down to the front. Come on down. Repeat this prayer. And you're in the kingdom. Sign this card. You're in the kingdom. Charles Finney was an 18th century evangelist. He was the one who perfected these man-centered methods. He used to brag that he could convince anyone to come to Christ. He's probably true. But if it's him drawing them to Christ, someone else can draw them away. If it's a decision made by man as a response to manipulation, someone else that's a better manipulator will manipulate you out of the kingdom. Not that you were ever in in the first place. They went out from us. Why? Because they were not of us. That's not evangelism. That's manipulation. Finney's methods, hey, they're pretty popular today. Everything I just said, y'all probably heard at some kind of a service in your life. Modern evangelists, modern preachers, come on down, repeat this prayer. You don't want to go to hell, do you? Well, no, that is a motivation. But when they use it, it's a manipulation. Come on down, sign here. Come on, let's get baptized. It'll be a nice, refreshing dip in the pool, right? That's not the gospel. That's man. Remember, it's the kindness of God that produces faith. It's the kindness of God that brings about salvation. It's not the schemes of men. What does verse 16 say again? To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Death to death. What's that mean? Y'all probably have heard John 3.16 before, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's familiar. We've got that memorized. It's the first thing we probably memorized. Genesis 1-1, John 3-16. It's probably the first two Bible verses any of us ever memorized. But the next verse is very important, and the verse after that too. Verse 17, For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. Hey, good news. More good news, right? but that the world might be saved through him. Why? Wow, that's the gospel, the good news, that Jesus died for sinners. Verse 18, though, tells us the default position of every person in Adam. He who believes, faith alone, right? Justified by faith alone. He who believes in him is not judged. We cannot be judged if we're joined to Christ. If we are united to him by faith alone, we will not be judged. The next phrase, he who does not believe has been judged already. An aroma, life to life for those trusting in Christ. An aroma from death unto death. They're already dead is what John 3.18 tells us. He who does not believe has been judged already, but he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. The dead are already dead. They just don't realize they're dead. They have already been judged. 
the dead are as good as dead, but contrarily, the alive are as good as alive, right? This idea that it's a decision made by men. If you can decide your way into the kingdom, you can decide your way out of the kingdom. It's not how it works. God has saved us. And by saving us, that means he has purchased us by his son. There is no take backs when it comes to God. But these dead who are already dead, we talked about the parable of the soils before, right? One soil's alive, three soils are dead. Of those soils, some of them appeared to be alive, didn't they? They looked alive, shot up really fast, growing, looking healthy as can be, and then what comes? The sun comes out, scorches them, revealing there's no root there. No root. Just pretending. I mentioned Spurgeon earlier. On this text, he had the following to say. I've seen the man who stood up on the table of a public house and grasping the glass in his hand. He said, Mates, I can say more than any of you, I am one of those who are redeemed with Jesus' precious blood. And then he drank his tumbler of ale and danced again before them and sang vile and blasphemous songs. Now that is a man to whom the gospel is a fragrance of death unto death. He hears the truth, but he perverts it. He takes what is intended by God for his good, and what does he do? He commits suicide with it. That knife which was given to him to open the secrets of the gospel, he drives it into his own heart. From death to death. That which is the purest of all truths, Spurgeon continues, and the highest of all morality, he turns into the pandering of his vice and makes it a scaffold to aid in building up his wickedness and sin. Are there any of you here like that man, says Spurgeon, who love to hear the gospel, and yet, and you call it, and yet live impurely? Who can sit down and say you are the children of God and still behave like liege servants of the devil? Be it known unto you that ye are liars and hypocrites. For the truth is not in you at all. If any man is born of God, he cannot sin. God's elect will not be suffered to fall into continual sin. Remember that. Continual sin. Unrepentant sin is what Spurgeon's getting at. They will never turn the grace of God into licentiousness, but it will be their endeavor as much as in them lies to keep near to Jesus. To keep near to Jesus, to keep looking to Jesus, to look unto Jesus, the founder and the finisher of our faith, the author and the completer of our faith, looking unto Christ. So I fell into sin. Am I one of those people Spurgeon's talking about? No. If you are torn up over your sin, if your sin convicts you, that is evidence that you are Christ's, that you do belong to him. It's the unrepentant, I don't care what I do sin, I'm sealed, that is the one who reveals that he is not of Christ. That's why the gospel is the only hope for the world. That's why we're commanded to proclaim the good news to every creature. Do you know who is a fragrance of life to life? Or who is a fragrance of death to death? Just by looking at them? Nope. That's above our pay grade. We proclaim the gospel to everyone. The good news that Jesus died for sinners. To everyone. Proclaim to the elect. Well, God is glorified. A soul is snatched from the flames. Proclaim to the reprobate. God is still glorified. And will be glorified in their judgment. Are you a fragrance of the gospel? Are you a fragrance from life to life to one group? Are you a fragrance of death to death to another group? 
One smell, two responses. I didn't ask if you're perfectly obeying, but are you a fragrance of the grace of God in the nostrils of those who are around you? Do people know that you are redeemed? They know you're a sinner. We can't hide that you're a sinner. No, but are you a redeemed sinner, purchased by Christ, being a pleasing aroma to those around you? When we sing, we're a pleasing aroma to each other and to our King. When we give, when we sing, when we take Lord's Supper, when you watch a baptism, pleasing aroma to God and to each other. Are you a foul stench in the nostrils of those who reject the gospel? Praise the Lord. It's the same smell. It's just a different response. When you hear that Jesus lived in your place, is that a pleasing aroma? Died in your place, is that a pleasing aroma? Does your theological olfactory nerve get stimulated with elation? When you sing of our blessed King, of our blessed Savior, do you smell the aroma of life? When someone instructs you in the gospel, in the things of Scripture, is it an aroma of life to you? Enjoy the wonderful scent of the grace of God and be encouraged. In your trials, be encouraged. In your troubles, be encouraged. In your tests, enjoy the wonderful aroma of Jesus Christ. Whatever we're going through, he said to cast your cares upon him. Let's pray. Father, you are so kind that you would send your Son to be the pleasing aroma in your nostrils and to impute that pleasant odor to us. Help us to dwell upon your kindness, to dwell upon your grace, even in the midst of failure, in the midst of trials and hardships, and especially in those times. May we look unto your Son who was pierced for us. May we respond to that wonderful scent of the gospel. Respond with life unto life. And may we reflect that. Reflect that odor to the world that's around us. And may we be a scent of the gospel. We ask that you, Lord, as we go into fellowship that you would bless this food for the nourishment of our bodies may our fellowship be sweet as we continue in jesus name amen